Good evening, and welcome to the John F. Kennedy Jr. Forum. My name is William Delaney, and I'm a member of the John F. Kennedy Jr. Forum Committee here at the Institute of Politics. Before we begin, note the exit doors, which are located on both the Park side and the JFK Street side of the Forum. In the event of an emergency, please gather your belongings, walk to the exit closest to you, and congregate in the JFK Park. Please also take a moment now to silence your cell phones. You can join the conversation online tonight by tweeting with the hashtag CyberComForum, which is also listed in your program. Tonight's events will begin shortly. Please take your seats and enjoy the program. Oh, look, you guys had water and everything already. We're way ahead of so welcome to the John F. Kennedy Jr. Forum at the Kennedy School, and we're especially welcome uh, our guest tonight, uh, Admiral Mike Rogers. Uh, yeah. Admiral Rogers is uh, an admiral, he's had a <laughs> career in the Navy. Uh, he is currently the head of the National Security Agency and also of Cyber Command, and you've got his resume there, and you can see that it includes uh, a stellar uh, performance as a military officer, but we're also proud that he was a participant in the National Security Fellows Program here four or five years ago, and one of his colleagues we were just talking about had given a call uh, uh, to me yesterday saying make sure to give him <laughs> warm regards, a fellow who's currently uh, commanding the Fifth Fleet in, in Bahrain. Right. So uh, fortunately, we have the great good fortune here at the school of having so many terrific national security folks coming through. And Mike has certainly won and is a good friend. So let me, let me just start at the top because some of us here are follow Cyber Command, NSA, and whatever. Right. Some are freshmen or sophomores or starting public policy students who wonder what is, what is the National Security Agency and what is Cyber Command and why are there two sure, of them? Sure. And, and in, is your answer to that, I, the second question is, why would a student who's interested in public service, why should they think about going to work for either? Jack. So before I answer the questions, first, thank you very much for the opportunity this evening. For all of you, thank you very much for taking time from busy personal and professional lives to sit down and have a dialogue. Um, I do this because, quite frankly, I'm interested in learning from others. Um, you know, it's interesting. You never know where the journey in life is going to take you as you heard mentioned, um, I've been here before as a, as a National Security Fellow and used to sit in the chairs and up there in the evenings at times, and never having a clue that I'd be sitting down here on the stage. So thank you very much for the opportunity. With respect to the, to the question, so first, what is Cyber Command and what is the National Security Agency? So Cyber Command, a very traditional military organization focused on three primary missions, defending weapon systems, platforms, and data within the Department of Defense. It's a very cyber defensive mission set. Second mission, generating range of capabilities to provide operational commanders around the world um, and policymakers with various options. That's a euphemistic way of saying we develop offensive capability and then we employ it. We have publicly acknowledged that we are employing, for example, offensive cyber capability in Syria and Iraq today in the fight against ISIL. The third primary mission for Cyber Command is if directed by the President of the United States or the Secretary of Defense, is to provide our capabilities to help defend critical infrastructure within the United States. What does that mean? The federal government has designated 16 different segments, if you will, of infrastructure in the, in the United States as having significant implications. Were they to be damaged, significantly destro degraded, destroyed, would have significant implications for our nation's security. Think about aviation, think about finance, think about power transmission, think about movement of uh, petroleum and other products. So there's 16 different segments. Those are the three primary missions of Cyber Command. To execute those missions, we have a very traditional military structure. We have subordinate organizations that um, are aligned with Cyber Command from each of the services. So I have a Marine subordinate organization, an Army, a Navy, and interestingly, a Coast Guard, a little unusual in the DOD military structure, we actually have a, a, a standing Coast Guard um, component to us, which is reflective of the Coast Guard's investment in view in cyber. 
The second job that I do is I'm the director of the National Security Agency. NSA is the largest of the 17 different elements within the US intelligence structure. It is a foreign intelligence organization, a foreign intelligence organization focused on one discipline, signals intelligence, to generate insights as to what nation states, actors, and individuals are doing in the foreign space of concern to us as a nation as well as our friends and allies. So let me translate that. That means we spy on foreigners. Roger yes. that. So okay. we, we, we're, we're, the, we're those spies. We're those electronic and, and all of, of the signal space. Right. Um, so that's our foreign intelligence mission. The second mission that NSA has, and one reason why the two organizations are closely aligned, even though they're separate, um, but we have them under one individual uh, under the current structure, is NSA also has an important information assurance or mission. We developed the cryptographic standards for all classified systems within the Department of Defense. We use our abilities to help defend um, systems, structures within the DOD, and increasingly we find ourselves doing this across the broader U.S. government. And increasingly, and Sony is a good example of this, we find ourselves being called upon to apply our defensive cyber capabilities to help um, within the private sector. Big growth areas um, for us. These two organizations, slightly different missions, and another important point, they use fundamentally different authorities. Cyber Command is a very traditional military operational organization. It uses Title 10 of the United States Code that outlines the legal basis for how the Department of Defense executes its military missions. NSA, an intelligence organization, uses Title 50 of the U.S. Code that outlines how, broadly how the U.S. government conducts intelligence. So related missions, but executed under two very different sets of authorities. And I'm, only, I'm always very mindful with both organizations as to exactly what we're doing and under what authority. Now, you ask the question, so if, if you were a student up here, what is it about Cyber Command or NSA that you know, I should be interested in, that, that you would suggest to me should be something I consider as I'm trying to figure out a pa my path in life? On the US Cyber Command side, we are motivated men and women who are using our capabilities to help ensure the cybersecurity of our department and to help generate options, as I said, for military commanders. We're helping to use cyber as a capability, both defensively and offensively, in combination with a whole lot of other capabilities out there to help ensure the nation is safe and secure and that we can use cyber as a tool to try to generate mission outcomes. On the NSA side, I would urge anybody, look, we are a foreign intelligence organization that uses a strong legal basis for what we do, that uses the power of technology to generate insights as to what is going on in the, in the world around us that is of concern to us as a nation. The men and women of NSA use their capabilities within a lawful framework to try to help ensure the security and the safety of our citizens, whether they be here, whether they be a hostage in the battlefield of Afghanistan, whether they, be, they have issues with cybersecurity, for example, if you want to be part of something bigger than yourself, if you want to be part of something that's focused on trying to help ensure the safety and well-being of our citizens as well as others, I would argue NSA is a perfect opportunity for you. Thank you. I think that's a good, in plain English, uh, what we do and <laughs> what we try to do and why it might be attractive. Let me take you to one of the more controversial areas. Uh, there aren't any of, of those, are there? No, no <laughs> none in your business. There are yes. none in my business. Uh, hacking American democracy, uh, the press books would call it. So uh, we read a lot in the newspapers about the foreign powers trying to manipulate the election results, and we heard a lot about that in the presidential debate. Uh, so I know this is difficult to talk about, and certainly specific actions, but let me still get you to take us behind the veil a little bit. Uh, so w what can NSA do to detect hackers outside the US who are seeking access to the registration rolls or otherwise? Uh, can you tell whether they changed my vote? Hmm. Uh, so I voted for candidate A and it showed up for can candidate B. If you found them doing one of these things or other, do you need to get some new authority from somebody to do something, or do you just do something? And finally, what can you do? Right. So first, let's take a look at the DNC Act. That's a US system 
It's illegal for NSA to be inside of it or to be monitoring it. So what do we do? What's our role? We're monitoring those foreign actors in their space as to what they are doing, what they're focused on, and how they are attempting to penetrate U.S. systems. We do that because of our presence overseas, not within U.S. systems, not within U.S. networks. That's why if you take the DNC hack, for example, generally our ability collectively as a government to identify activity, actors, who's done what, is all about teamwork. It's about the ability to bring forward the foreign intel intelligence capabilities of NSA and a few other organizations within the nation's intelligence structure and team that with law enforcement, in this case FBI, because they're an internal domestic organization. They um, are focused on the US piece of this, as well as partnering with the private sector itself. So Sony was a very good example of that. You know, it's hard to believe November 2014, we're, we're coming up on two years. In the aftermath of the Sony hack, as Sony approached the US government and said, hey, look, we've had a major penetration that has resulted in destruction of portions of our network. Sony approached the US government and said, we would ask for the government's help in trying to understand who did it, how did they do it, and how do we make sure that our network is structured in a way to preclude it from happening again? And so several government organizations uh, the Department of Homeland Security, the FBI, and NSA put an integrated team together to partner with Sony as well as the private company that Sony had hired to help them work their way through this issue. That's a good example to me of those are the kinds of partnerships that we have to create if we're going to truly generate insight and understanding as to what actors are doing. Because for us, while we get some very interesting insights, I'm the first to acknowledge it's only part of this. And it's the ability to bring both the foreign and the domestic piece together, and the foreign piece, that's our role. So, but let me stay with the election just for a second, sure, sure. because to the extent that a foreign power could discredit the electoral process and lead many citizens to imagine that I voted for X right. and, and the vote was recorded for Y, that would be called discrediting democracy. And I don't know whether that's one of the 16 parts of critical <laughs> in infrastructure, but if it's not, it's assumed to be, so for sure, nobody would have a dis dispute about that. So can you tell us a little bit about what do you do to, uh, well, I, I can take it from the newspaper and from what a number of people, including Clapper, the head of DNI, have said, that something is going on. <laughs> and we've seen something go on in the case of the DNC, and we've seen things released. But can you tell us a little bit, how would you know if my vote was, I mean, could you tell, could he, can he change my vote? Can you know if he changed my vote? And if he did, can you do anything about it? Other than say, oh, <laughs> that's, our, you know, the voting, voting, I mean, recently there was a vote in, I can't remember, some country where the ballots went wrong and you have to hold the vote all right. over again. Yeah. So if I could, let me, let me do two parts of this. Okay. The first part was a little tangential to what you said, but it struck me as you were speaking. I think we need to step back and ask ourselves, what does critical infrastructure really mean in the digital age of the 21st century? We have generally historically tended to find critical infrastructure associated with an output or a service. It generates the ability to move people in the form of a transportation network. It generates the ability to do banking. It generates the ability to either generate and then move power. The, the issue that we're dealing with on the electoral side, to me, though, goes to a broader sense of, so what is critical infrastructure in this digital age? Data, I would argue, for example, is taking on a very different value in and of itself. And the ability of individuals to harness the tools of big data analytics now make access to large data concentrations that I can remember at a more junior, earlier age in my career, we would look at it and go, that is so large, no one's going to be able to really to manipulate it, to generate insight, and really get any meaning about it. We can feel pretty confident. I would argue that's not the nature of the world we're living in now. The power of data, big data analytic tools, is now making large data concentrations. OPM is a very good example of that. Is making large data concentrations very attractive and of increased importance to a whole lot of actors out there. So I, I think one of the aspects yep. of you know, critical infrastructure, so what does that mean? Because there's lots of things right now, if you just look at data, that we would not historically have identified as 
critical infrastructure. Right. I look at the, the election sequence, for example, right. as an example of, do we need to step back and reassess this? Hey, look, this really is part of our critical infrastructure. In terms of NSA's ability to generate insights, I remind people first, we're not inside that voting structure. We're not inside those networks. So I don't monitor it from the inside. What we do is we're trying to understand the actions of foreign actors as they are trying to, to approach the network, if you will. So whose job would it be to, well, let's imagine, God forbid, that the election has now been held and right. then a number of states people say, uh, the exit poll showed X and the count showed Y and we suspect that something went on. Uh, so you can report that from our foreign intelligence, somebody had the intention to do something. Right. You can even see some activities coming this way, but you stop at the water's edge. So who tells us whether they actually changed my vote? And, and, so, then, and then if anything were to, right. if we were to conclude they might have, what do we do about it? So remember, right now in our structure, states, in the current structure, mm -hmm. states have broad responsibility for the execution of elections, both federal, state, and local. Within the U.S. government, the Department of Homeland Security has overall responsibility for the application broadly. It's a little more nuanced, right. but just speaking broadly. Has overall responsibility for the application of federal capability to help those outside the federal structure. So what I would expect happen is the state would have overall responsibility were there concerns that they thought there was an issue that would call into question the result, they potentially would approach the federal government. The Department of, Hol of Homeland Security would likely have overall responsibility. They likely would turn to the FBI, us, and maybe one or two others to say, can we put together a team and harness the breadth of this knowledge and insight and capability you have to come back with an assessment? Do we think the result was valid? Do, do we think it was manipulated in any way? So that's how I, okay, I think then, it would I mean, it's, it's extremely complex, but I appreciate your simplifying it for us so that we can, can get the picture there. And then <coughs> if I just stay one more round on mm -hmm. it, in terms of what can we do? So let's imagine that we, after this team gets together, we conclude that lo and behold, folks in Massachusetts thought they voted for Clinton, right. but they actually uh, were recorded as voting for Trump or vice versa. But, and so uh, a state ch change. If I want to have a nightmare, I mean, remember 2000, where we went on for months mm, without right. knowing who had won the election. That obviously has an impact right. on citizens thinking, how is the system working? So what can we do about this? So it's a broader policy piece. And remember, as, the, as Cyber Command, I'm a military operational guy. As NSA, I'm an intelligence professional who brings, ap who brings capabilities to try to help a broader team. My sense is what we're going to see is I'm, I'm aware already of multiple states attempting to assess their network uh, election structure to make sure it's in a positive place for the upcoming sequence that we're going to deal with next month. After that, I would also expect, again, I don't want to speak for an incoming administration, but I would not be surprised if in the aftermath of the election, then we go into a broader, more long-term effort to step back, assess it, and ask ourselves, are we really comfortable with this structure? Do we need to make changes? One of the things we got going for us right now um, is the fact that it is not an integrated, single, 50-state, um, single automated structure. So they require 50 operations. And every yeah. state does it slightly yeah. differently. Now, on the other end, as you highlighted, yeah. history would suggest hey, small, very narrow results can sometimes have broad strategic implications. You, as you've indicated, you saw that play out previously. So I, I think you'll see specific areas, particularly highlighted, specifically targeted in, in light of that concern, which is a very legitimate one. Okay, so one other just uh, related to this one. Sure. Uh, so Charlie Allen, whom you know is an mm -hmm. old famous CIA hand, whom I know for a long time, right. and he was reported in the press, and I think reliably, to say that uh, uh, Clapper, the director of national intelligence, one of, one of my uh, bosses. Mike's counterparts, uh, was charged, uh, he was to coordinate an effort to better understand Russian covert operations uh, that may be addressed to discrediting right. American democracy. Now, uh, 
I told him initially when he said that, wait a minute, if, if uh, the objective is to discredit, um, discredit American democracy, Washington is full of people who have been very effectively doing this <laughs> long before the world of cyber. So who either, these are, Russians, either these are unwitting agents or just fellow travelers. Right. That's a bad joke. But the, uh, uh, so uh, what should we take from that? Uh, that, Clapper's, sorry, take from that from the notion that Clapper is trying to coordinate an effort to so, determine I, whether there's such an effort and what right. the consequences so, would be. So my comment would be, look, Within the intelligence community, that's one of our primary responsibilities to help inform policymakers as to what you know, actors are doing out there, what are they doing, for what purpose, what's their strategic intent, and to help then them as they try to develop policy. Okay, so if you're telling me Nation X is doing this, this is their strategy, this is what they are trying to achieve, that's designed then to feed policymakers who come back and say, in light of that, here's the kind of policy choices that we right. think that we need to make. So this is designed to help inform that broader policy. And this discussion. would properly be done across the whole intelligence right, community. Right, you'll see it across the yeah. entire U.S. intelligence structure. So let me take you off in an ex exotic alternative direction for a second. 1984. And I'll even... The book or the year? The book. Okay. okay. So for, stu for George students... George Orwell and we're thinking... For students here who haven't read uh, George Orwell's 1984, shame on you. And, if you can't remember it, you should reread it. And some reasonable Americans, including, let me say, my wife, okay, thinks that the advance of cyber capabilities uh, that allow you, you basically to collect everything, the technologies that allow to collect everything, and surveillance begins to look more and more like 1984. Mm. So she makes me reread pieces of it from time to time. And then for students who don't read but watch television, there's a television show, I gather, that does this person of interest where they have some machine that, uh, uh, so how much should we worry about 1984? Well, first I remind people, look, there are both technological as well as legal and policy implications for all this. If you just speak in as the, the director of NSA, I remind people there is a legal framework that controls everything we do. We do not arbitrarily decide, hey, today I feel like collecting against fill in the blank. There's a set of priorities that are determined by the nation's leaders that they highlight to us. These are the threats that we are most concerned about. They're actually tiered and prioritized for us. We then, if we're going to then try to use those priorities to focus on what are we going to collect against, what are we going to attempt to generate insight against. We then have a very specific legal framework that we have to use in doing that. We just can't arbitrarily decide, okay, so if you're, you're telling me the priority is country X, then I can do anything I want anywhere, anytime to try to generate those insights. The, the legal framework also specifically prevents our ability to do collection against any, any U.S. person in the United States. That is illegal. Okay, can't do it. That's what the FBI, law enforcement, a domestic organization does. Um, and again, they have a legal framework. They have a court structured system that provides oversight and control of what they can do. So I acknowledge that the technology um, is driving us to a point where the ability to rapidly assimilate a wide range of inputs, a wide range of data to try to generate a very coherent, comprehensive picture is getting better. I would also remind people, just because you see something on television or in a film, that doesn't mean that it's r really happening or that it's technically capable. Um, a, NSA is a very, I'm first to acknowledge, we're a very capable organization. The nation has made significant investment in us and it's given us significant responsibilities. But I also remind people, boy, a good deal of what I read out there, I'm thinking that's not even technologically possible. Number one. Number two, I wouldn't even want to do that because that would slow us down on our core mission. I'm not interested in being one big Hoover vacuum cleaner. That just slows us down. What we need to do is focus, again, based on the priorities and where do we generate knowledge that generates the greatest value against those priorities. And the answer isn't, well, just try to collect everything everywhere. That's a totally unmanageable um, and counterproductive approach to do in business for us. Particularly after the Snowden revelations, and then a lot of 
I think, uh, exaggeration of them in the press. Uh, President Obama appointed a panel of five people, mm -hmm. including one who's a senior fellow non-resident at the Belfer Center, Mike Morell, and another, Cass Sunstein, who's a professor at the law school. And they did a review of all of the operations and came to the conclusion, you can look it up and read the report, that NSA has actually been the most legal, uh, reviewed, and bound of the organizations in the intelligence community. So I don't know if you want to say anything about that. No, but I, that was a, this was a just independent people of whom Cass is a professor at the law school and Michael is here from time to time. Right. The other was this fellow Mike Stone, who's a professor at Chicago right, Law School and Chicago. had been on, on the board of the ACLU. So a very independent panel who were not engaged in the pro yeah. problem otherwise. Yeah. Right. I think, that, to me, we, we sometimes are conflating issues. At the National Security Agency, folks, we don't set the law, we don't write the law. Our job is to execute the mission we're assigned within that legal and policy framework and to assure that we never deviate from that legal and that policy framework. That is what I am held accountable to as a director, and that is what I remind every member of our workforce. We don't violate the law, the policy, and the authorities that have been granted to us. And if we make a mistake, we stand up and we say we made a mistake. We inform the court, we inform the congressional oversight. Now, it is certainly reasonable as a society that we ask ourselves, okay, but are we comfortable with that law? Are we comfortable with that legal framework? That's a very important conversation for us to have. But to me, at times, we have totally blurred these two issues to, boy, NSA must be this rogue organization that's violating the law, and I'm thinking, we actually had three major reviews post uh, media leaks. All of them came back with, you can certainly argue, do you agree with the law? Do you think that the law is in the best interest of the nation? But NSA doesn't violate the law. NSA ensures that it adheres to the court orders that it uses to execute our mission. And NSA keeps its congressional oversight, who act as the duly elected representatives of each and every one of us as citizens. We keep our congressional oversight masters fully informed about what we do. Um, and as I said, when we get it wrong and we make a mistake, a mistake as I remind, I also remind people, look, at its heart, NSA has some amazing technology, but it's an organization powered by motivated men and women. And sometimes motivated men and women make a mistake. And when we make a mistake, we stand up and we hold ourselves accountable. We don't bury it, we don't sweep it under the rug. We acknowledge that we need to improve. So you've mentioned a couple of episodes like the Sony uh, mm -hmm. hack or the OPM files. So if I just reading the papers, <laughs> the last several years, there seem to be a lot more of these cases right, of right. other states engaged in cyber spying or attacks on the US or allies. So the question that goes to how, how, are, how effectively are we defending or protecting or deterring? So if I, right. in the Sony case, if I've got it right, the North Koreans uh, were identified as having gone into the Sony files, uh, destroyed a lot of whatever, okay. In the, in the Iran uh, case, Iran was identified, I think, for cyber attacks on a New York bank, if I remember. Right, right. Uh, and maybe some dam, or I can't remember the details. In the China case, or the, the theft of the OPM files, at least in the newspapers report, that China stole 21 million files of folks that work at NSA, including everybody within who the files government for, yeah. a, for a security clearance like me. Okay, so uh, how are, well is this problem getting worse, or we're just discovering it more? Hmm. And and what are we doing to 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 make it? Uh, I mean, or should we just say this is the new world? Yeah. That's where we live, or, or I mean, you, I'm sure are thinking about how can we defend ourselves so that they can't steal OPM files, right, right. or how can we maybe deter them by threatening that if they do that, we'll do something analogous or something worse. So I, I, I won't speak for all of you, but broadly, I, I don't think any of us are comfortable with the status quo. 
I mean, if I asked you how many people have had personal information stolen, uh, uh, you know, your internet service prov provider account broken into, I mean, it is getting to the point where almost a majority of us on an annual basis now are dealing with not only penetrations in our personal lives, but also more broadly in the private sector, across segments of the government, um, and this is an inter international, it's not unique to the United States. As a nation, we have treated each instance on the merits of this particular case. In the case of Sony, we had high confidence that the actor was the North Koreans. We're, we were able to show policymakers, here's who did it, here's how they did it, and then we're able to, um, then that in engendered a policy decision that came to the following conclusions. We must publicly acknowledge the activity, we must publicly attribute the activity, and then thirdly, we must take concrete action to ensure the North Koreans, in this case, understand that such activity is unacceptable and that if they want to continue along these lines, we are prepared to do even more in response. So um, first week in December, if my memory is right, sometime between the 7th and the, and the 10th, the President of the United States, the 2014, the President of the United States came out and indicated Sony was um, hacked and was, was the victim of an offensive attack that destroyed part of its infrastructure that the actor was the North Koreans, and he specifically highlighted what element within the North Korean government did it. And then he talked about how we were gonna respond initially with a series of economic sanctions, and he also was very vocal, very public in informing the North Koreans, and if you insist on continuing this further, we will, are prepared to take additional steps at the time and place of our choosing. You don't want, signaling very clearly, you do not wanna to continue to go down this road. Now. It's been, knock on wood, almost two years. That seems to have had a measure of impact. I'm not gonna argue that it has stopped North Korean behavior. It, we haven't seen a similar repeat in the United States. That's not true in terms of what the North Koreans are doing in some other places. In the case of China, we've been in, a, in an extended dialogue with our Chinese counterparts in which we've tried to highlight. We acknowledge <clears throat> that nation states will use cyber as a tool to generate insights as to what is going on in the world around them. We call that espionage and spying. We acknowledge nation states will do that. That's called stealing OPM <laughs> files or right. yeah. the, the The point we try to make to our Chinese counterparts is in the US structure, it is totally unacceptable, and we have a strong firewall, that you would use government cyber capabilities to penetrate foreign systems, to steal data, uh, for example, um, aircraft information, that you would steal that information, bring it back to the United States, and then the government would turn to pick a major U.S. aerospace company, Lockheed, Boeing, whatever, and that we would hand that data over to them and say, this is what you're gonna have to compete against. This is what you have to be prepared to be better than. We don't do that. However, in our Chinese counterparts, we had been bringing to their attention that we had seen repeated instances where we were watching the Chinese government use their state capabilities to penetrate U.S. industries, to extract uh, proprietal information, and then to share it with their own private sector, their own companies, as a bid to save million, billions of dollars in research and development to accelerate their ability to bring online more advanced technologies. And we said to our Chinese counterparts, this is totally unacceptable. If you want to have the kind of relationship between our two nations that I think we both are, 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 are aiming to achieve, this won't work. This is unacceptable to us. So September, I think it was September the 25th of 2015, again, just over a year ago, the two presidents met at a summit in Washington, and both Xi Jinping and President Obama agreed that each nation would not use cyber, the, the capabilities of the state, to penetrate the private sector to gain economic advantage that would then be shared with their respective private sectors. Um, as an intelligence professional, this is something we continue to watch closely, trying to ensure we understand what are the Chinese doing, what are they not doing. Um, they, they clearly haven't stopped using cyber as a tool. We understand that, that wasn't the agreement. The area that we're really focused on is, so as we see data being extracted, where is it going to and what use? So we continue to monitor that closely. In the case of the Iranians you highlighted, we have done um, indictments and public outing of individuals associated with efforts, <clears throat> denial of service efforts, the one you highlighted. If you go back 2011, 
to the 2014 time period, we were observing the Iranians conducting significant denial of service efforts, trying to take down public facing websites from major US financial institutions. They, they were never successful on the positive side, um, but it certainly led to some interesting dialogue about at the time about, hey, if they are successful, hey, how are we gonna stop this? We, we can't allow this to work. We used public outing and indictments to highlight that. That behavior um, has improved over time. That's a positive. I think on the Russian piece, we're clearly working our way through that. That seems to be entering a different dynamic these days. You've, you've seen that in media reporting, and we'll work our way through that broadly in a pol through a policy process. The only thing I'd highlight to finally conclude is, so every instance is slightly different. We treat each instance slightly different on the merits and the specifics of, of the particular situation. It's not a one size fits all. And another point I would make, and then I'll, I'll shut up. I think it's also important to remember that just because someone comes at us in cyber doesn't mean that the, that the def default response has to be, well, we have to go back and do the exact same thing. Sure. My argument is, as is with others, we should think more broadly, think more strategically, and harness the broad capabilities and advantages that we draw as a nation. Just don't default to cyber. So you saw that, for example, play out in the North Korean piece. You saw the use of the legal piece play out with the Chinese and the Iranians, for example. So again, for public policy students in your course, this would be called cross-domain uh, retaliation, retaliation and deterrence. And I think it's uh, conceptually well-developed, and I think you gave a good description of it. Let me explain how the rest of the night proceeds. So Admiral Rogers has fortunately given us the whole time for the forum. You have an opportunity to ask questions now, and there are mics, two of them on the floor and two of them in the loge. And if you'll just line up, uh, the game plan is line up, damn it. you should introduce yourself. Questions are brief and end with a question mark. We'll start with this gentleman here. Can I make one comment before we get to the questions? Please. I, I like to be very upfront with people. There will be some things where I'm gonna to have to say to you, look, I apologize, but in a public unclassified environment, there are just some things I cannot get specifically into. So I, I don't want anybody thinking, well, well, boy, he doesn't want to talk to us, far from it. So this please, is a, ask this away. Is a, this is a public event, and we even have David Sanger in his other, in his uh, press hat sitting here, legal, le legally, okay. This gentleman, please. My name is Andrew Kingsbury. I'm an Extension School student, and my question is related to uh, whistleblowers like uh, Thomas Drake, uh, who worked at the NSA. Um, just a real brief explanation of what, who Thomas Drake was uh, or is. Uh, he whistle blew about uh, various programs at the NSA. One was a, a program where there was massive overspenditure and uh, almost, not fraudulent, but uh, it was just a bloated program. He uh, he tried to expose that, as well as uh, what, in his opinion and uh, reporter's opinion, was an illegal program. Uh, so, so first, can I, let's take the emotion out of this. Oh. It, it, if I could. Yeah. So his allegation and his concern was he disagreed fundamentally with a program that NSA had developed. I mean, that, that's very fair. Mm -hmm. um, now, f for me, this is old. He, he did this. This is like 16 you know, 12 years ago. This is way before I, I ever got there. So I'm the first to acknowledge I am much smarter about the current process. But if I could, let me use the uh, first. Did I interrupt you and not let you finish? Uh, yeah, I'll, answer, I'll ask my question whenever you're done. No, no, you go ahead. I, oh, I okay. apologize. All right. Uh, right. Uh, yeah, so uh, that's my uh, what I've been told in the media and so on. So, of course, <laughs> I don't have your uh, security clearance and so on. But I just wanted to know, for somebody that does have um, a matter that they would like to whistleblow about, uh, it does seem like he did go to quite an extent to uh, use internal methods and people who did have uh, security clearances, uh, and it seems like he really did exhaust those options. Um, so I think that's the way to go. Uh, I don't think that our secrets should be out there in the open. Uh, so what should somebody do um, so that these matters can be handled internally and uh, don't feel like they have to go to the press and, and so on? So first, let's talk about what the legal definition of yeah. a whistleblower is. I'm a, not angry at you. A set of... <laughs> <laughs> a set of protections that are provided to an individual who alleges illegal, unethical, waste, or fraud, or the, if my memory is right, four broad categories. Correct. Um, one point I make about 
whistleblowers is that gives you the opportunity to raise your concern in a protected status. That doesn't mean that you're right. Mm -hmm. And so I always try to remind people, look, um, it, it's somewhat interesting to me in, in the dynamic we'll read, well, so-and-so alleges X. Because you didn't gr uh, agree, you didn't protect them as a whistleblower. And I'm going, wait, wait a second. Whistleblower is designed to ensure that you are protected from retaliation. You have the opportunity to raise your concerns. Mm -hmm. It doesn't mean that the concern you raise is necessarily valid or legitimate. And I'm not saying in this case it was or it wasn't. I just try to remind people it's somewhat two different but related processes. Um, so there is that, it's by statute. You can do that within, in this case, NSA. You can do it in, in other organizations within the federal government. You also have the ability, if, if you feel something is being done, again, fraudulent, wasteful, illegal, you, <laughs> You have um, protected status with the inspector generals of every organization in the federal government has an inspector general. In addition, the director of national intelligence has one that oversees. You have the right as a citizen to raise your concerns with Congress. And again, I have to respond to that as if you raise allegations against the NSA. Um, so my only point is there's a process there that's designed to ensure that an individual can raise concerns and not be retaliated. I'm not gonna pretend for one minute it's a perfect situation. The, the point I try to make as a leader is, we have got to create an environment where the men and women of our workforce feel that they can come forward. Because as a leader, I took an oath to uphold the Constitution. I, within the ethos of my profession as a commission officer, I should not and will not execute an order or direction that I believe is illegal, immoral, or unethical. That's what I have signed up to personally. And I wanna be part of a team that applies that broadly. That doesn't mean we're always gonna agree, I'm the first to acknowledge that. Um, the, the challenge I find sometimes is, and it's reflective of the broader polarized world we find ourselves in now, if you don't agree with me, it's because you're evil and your motives are bad. No, it's perhaps that based on my background, my perspective, my experience, I come to a different conclusion than you do. Good question. Thank you. This gentleman. Hi, I'm Philip, I'm a sophomore at the college. So we know from some things that have leaked to the press, including Olympic Games, you probably can't talk about, that the U.S. has some pretty powerful offensive cyber capabilities, but at the same time, we're no longer the only ones with capabilities like that. So can you talk a little bit about the development of cyber defensive capabilities and in a system with as many access points as U.S. critical infrastructure? Is there even a coherent concept of cyber defense? Um, First of all, I'd say, look, when it comes to cyber defense, there is no one single strategy, there is no one single tool or capability. My experience leads me to believe that the right answer is you gotta do this in defense in depth with multiple components to your strategy. I, I think it's fair to say that right now, <laughs> the odds favor the offensive side. That's in, in no small part because the reality is today we are dealing with network structures that were designed and built in a totally different environment in which redundancy, resiliency, and defensibility were never core design characteristics. It was simplistically about how do you achieve maximum efficiency, maximum effectiveness at the lowest price point, simplistically. And it wasn't so much, look, you're gonna be using this network in an environment in which others are gonna be attempting to penetrate it. Boy, therefore you must design defensibility into it as a core design characteristic. So as a nation, we are dealing literally with trillions of dollars of sunk capital costs in the form of our network structures today that were built in a very different time in a very different place. So as a guy who's responsible for defending networks, uh, that certainly makes life incredibly challenging. That's why the, the strategy to deal with this, I think, has got to, we gotta make it harder for people to penetrate our network. We gotta get to concepts like norms of behavior. We've got to change the risk calculus for actors so that they, know, they stop and say to themselves, even if I could technically do this, would the benefits outweigh the risk or the cost? I mean, I mean not, the nuclear piece isn't a, a, a particularly great example, but it's one that people often use. You know, we, we've, we acknowledge you could use nuclear weapons against our nation in the probability is, if you did it in massive numbers, you could probably get some significant number through our missile defense systems. 
On the other hand, we also remind people, look, if you did that, the price that you would pay, you don't want to go down this road. The challenge, one of the challenges I see as we look at the future is that deterrence model is based on a nation state approach. What? So tell me how you deter non-state actors. Most nation states, while they want to gain an advantage, they, they do not want to destroy the basic structures as the price of gaining that advantage. They generally believe that the status quo has broadly provided them advantage and opportunity. For a non-state actor, you take ISIL as an example, they have no desire to sustain the status quo. Their risk calculus is totally different. What's going to happen when they, for example, decide that the World Wide Web offers unoffensive weapons that they can use against the West? That is going to be a very tough fight. This, this gentleman in this loge, please. Uh, thank you so much. My name is Jack, and hey, Jack. I'm a sophomore at the college. I'm also on the JFK Junior Forum Committee, and this question comes to us from Twitter. Uh, do you have a comment on the arrest of Harold Martin, the huh. NSA contractor accused of stealing classified right. data? So we have publicly acknowledged that we have arrested an individual. The FBI has done it, but we were part of this process. This is an ongoing investigation, so this is one of these, I apologize, I'm just not gonna be able to get into this. But we do acknowledge, hey, we arrested uh, a contractor who has been, had been employed at the NSA. Okay, thank you. Thanks. So there's, Thanks. A, there's a breaking news story about another NSA contractor who has been arrested, but it's unfolding, so you'll have to wait to see what David writes in the <laughs> New York Times tomorrow, because he's, he's making it up tonight. Go ahead. He's making it up. <laughs> Sir, please. Hello, hello Admiral. Uh, thank you for your service. Uh, I'm Ankit. I'm a senior at Harvard College, and I'm studying computer science. Uh, oh. Earlier today, I went to a Belfer security, uh, pro cybersecurity project luncheon oh. with the director of the Electronic Frontier Foundation, uh, who I believe is involved with some litigation with the NSA. And she was discussing how part of the complexity of litigation relies around the definition of what a lawfully protected search or seizure is, which is a complex issue because of, uh, for one, we have targeted searches versus implicit searches that get caught up when we do targeted searches. There's end, endpoint searches versus when you intercept the internet backbone. There's when people are in different countries. You were clearly paying country. attention to what she country. had to say. Very good. <laughs> so uh, my question to you is, um, given that the Fourth Amendment was written almost 250 years ago, and we're using this amendment as a way of interpreting what a constitutionally protected search is, what is your interpretation of how the NSA or perhaps other intelligence agencies should do lawful searches to execute their mission while also respecting the Constitution? So for me, a lawful search is defined by the court. I don't define that, the court defines that. And we need to make sure that we're complying with that court order and that legal framework. I I'm the first to acknowledge I'm not a lawyer. Um, we have plenty of lawyers that work on the team. Um, so for me, that, that's the court defines this for us. The court outlines exactly what we can do. They identify the duration, the specific target that we're authorized to go against, the, and the, the specific data that we'll go after, so to speak, simplistically. It's not quite that simple, but. And so the court for us defines that. One of the things that I think, and I'm gonna riff on this just, just a little bit more broadly. And in some ways to me, this really comes home in the encryption discussion. I think we've all got to acknowledge we are in a place now where the current state of technology has outstripped our legal and policy frameworks. And so I think one of the challenge for all of us is how do we realign those? It goes to some of the points that you were trying to make. This is incredibly complex. How do we work our way through some of these tough issues? And I would argue this is something that's so important. We need a broader societal discussion on this. You don't want me unilaterally deciding this. I would argue you don't want law enforcement. There are some issues, and I have this discussion with some of my private sector industry counterparts. Quite frankly, I don't think you ought to define this either. We need a broader discussion as a society. What are we comfortable with? What does privacy mean in the digital age? You know, we've got to sit down and have some tough discussions about it. Thank you. This gentleman, please. Sir. Admiral, first of all, thank you for taking the time out of your very busy, busy schedule to come and join us tonight. Um, I'm Lieutenant Colonel Jack Arthod and also a National Security Fellow, uh, oh, so cool. I appreciate your experience in, in joining us. Uh, my question is about you being dual-hatted as mm -hmm. both the Director of NSA as well as the Cybercom Commander. 
Um, and so what current conflicts do you see in executing your Title 50 and Title 10 duties? And do you see the uh, separation of those two organizations um, any time in the near future as a result of that potential conflict if there is one? Jack, so let me start by saying, so let's walk through why we built it this way. About seven years ago, the Department of Defense came to the conclusion that cyber was an operational domain in which we needed to generate capability as a department. As we were working our way through how we were gonna do that, what kind of structure we were gonna create, what kind of level of investment we were gonna make, we stepped back and we asked ourselves, how do we build on previous investment, previous expertise? And one of the questions that was asked at the time was, what is the current center of gravity for cyber expertise and cyber capability within the Department of Defense? And the answer was the National Security Agency. Um, because while NSA is an intelligence organization, it is a combat support agency within the Department of Defense. And as the director of NSA, my boss is the Secretary of Defense. And so seven years ago, we made the decision, both because we thought it would provide more effective outcomes, because rather than start Cyber Command from zero and wait for it to be fully mature, we could take advantage of the capabilities resident in NSA to use that to help make Cyber Command more capable quicker. We also said we could be more efficient. We could save money and resources rather than replicate all the investment that the department and by extension U.S. citizens had made at NSA and replicate that with Cyber Command. Cyber Command could take advantage of some of those investments. It's now seven years later. Um, we are currently, as we often do, stepping back and asking ourselves, does that structure still make sense? Has seven years of practical experience led us to believe that perhaps some of the assumptions we made are, are proving to be different than we thought? Um, that is a, in the end, the president's gonna have to make uh, this decision. He'll get plenty of input. That process is working its way through. We'll see where it goes. My input to that process has been, look, in the long run, I think it's the right thing to do. The only question in my mind is the timing. You want to do it, I believe, we want to make sure we do it in a way that minimizes risk to mission for both of those organizations, Cyber Command and NSA, and that we do it in a way that ensures the highest probability of success to both organizations. And we'll work our way through this, and ultimately they'll make a decision will be made, and we'll take it from there. Uh, there was a second part to what you asked, and I apologize. No, that that was, covered it. Thank you, sir. That okay, was the, thanks, that was, thanks. again, it's a, that's a complicated issue for those of you that don't follow the organizational mm -hmm. ins and outs in the U.S. government. But uh, Mike, I thought that was a absolutely mm -hmm. terrific answer for making it simple enough to get the big picture, but also the complexity. This lady in the fora, in the loge, please. Oh, ma'am. Thank you very much, Admiral. Um, my name is Fiona. I'm a PhD student at MIT down the road. And my question uh, relates to the fact that the Chinese military is currently going through a reorganization mm -hmm. of its uh, cyber forces. Right. Given that other countries are likely to have cyber military forces, from a US perspective, what would be the best way for the Chinese to go about reorganizing those forces? <laughs> Given I want to compliment you. No one has ever asked me how I would reorganize the Chinese military before. And, and if I could just add, they're looking very closely at the way that the United States is doing, so would that be a model that uh, you would recommend? <laughs> And do you have any particular vulnerabilities <laughs> that they might take advantage of? <laughs> so, so I, I'm not going to get into if, if I think it's good or bad, um, other than to acknowledge the Chinese are in the midst of a restructure right now within their cyber capabilities, particularly within the PLA, the People's Liberation Army, the military, if you will, for the PRC. We partner closely, we, Cyber Command, we, the Department of Defense, we, the U.S. government, partner very closely with a whole range of nations out there, as lots of nations are trying to work their way through what's the right structure, what's the right way, what's the right level of investment we need to make here. For most nations, a level of investment like Cyber Command, for example, is difficult for them. It's a reflection of both the priority we place on this mission and the, the, the fact that as, as a large nation, with the largest you know, uh, economy in the world, the biggest military in the world, global interests, we have elected to make significant investments in this area. I'm not arguing they're perfect, but we've elected to make significant investments in this area. Other nations right now are trying to work their way through what's the right structure. I spent a good deal of time in these duties. I was just overseas a week ago, sitting down with the senior most military leadership of a, a, year, of a nation in Europe, 
talking about so what, what's their way ahead? What insights can we share with them? Are there lessons that we would share with them or we, where I would say, hey, look, this is one thing we got wrong. Don't do it this way. We do that regularly. I'm not going to get into the specifics of it. We do that regularly with a whole host of nations all over the world because we're all trying to acknowledge, look, <laughs> this is an incredibly complex mission set. It's a long-term problem. This is not going away. And as nations around the world, to include us, are making investments, you've got a lot of other nations now asking, so what are the implications for me? What, what do we need to do as a result of that? So, the, so thanks. Thank you for an excellent question. I told First had, time ever. I've got to give you a big prop. Yeah, I've never been we had a bet, We had a bet about whether he would hear a question that he had never heard before. <laughs> so you get the prize. Well Please. done. Uh, good morning, sir. Midshipman sir. Maginant, MIT, Computer Science, Electrical Engineering. We met earlier this I saw morning. you earlier today, didn't I? Yes, sir. There you go. Um, I was wondering if you could speak on the training plan for proficient cyber military officers mm -hmm. and how you plan to grow the relatively young U.S. Cybercom in order to sufficiently defend against the actions of foreign actors, especially given the uh, suggested split of the NSA and Cybercom. So first, for Cyber Command, we as a department, the Department of Defense, have come to the conclusion that we need a dedicated professional workforce to do that. That that workforce should be composed of both uniforms, active guard and reserve, civilians and contractors. That by using that multi-tiered approach to doing business, we can try to harness the best of all three of those categories. In the case of the military piece, which I'm, I'm assuming, and if I got it wrong, you tell me, is probably of greatest interest to you. Each of the services has come to the conclusion that to do this, they need to create a dedicated set of skills and specialties where someone can do cyber for an entire career. That, that wasn't the case, you go back five, 10 years ago, we didn't do it that way. It manifests itself in, look at your commissioning program. We are now bringing officers in from, from ROTC, like um, Harvard and others here in the metro area, as well as the Naval Academy, where we are now bringing them directly into the cyber area in a way that five years ago, we, we didn't do. We would say, hey, look, you need to go, assuming you're fully physically fit, you need to go be a much more traditional ship driver, aviator, you know, pilot, or NFO. You need to be a submariner. You need to be a SEAL. We've come to the conclusion that cyber represents a foundational level of investment for us, and therefore, we need to change the way we're assessing officers and enlisted. The positive side to me is we have more people who want to join the force than we have space for right now. So the positive side is we're able to bring quality, motivated men and women in both military and civilian and contractor. Thank you. Um, we're exceeding our current retention figures right now. So that's good. That, that oh. speaks to a workforce that feels incredibly motivated. One of the things I find the most energizing as you, you particularly see this, not that you don't see it on NSA, but I'll highlight it on the Cyber Command side. This workforce's self-image is that they are the digital warriors of the 21st century and that they are the cutting edge of the future and that what they provide is critical to the department's ability to execute its broader set of missions and at the same time providing the department and their fellow soldiers, sailors, airmen, and Marines a greater set of capability to be used to achieve mission outcomes that really motivates the organization. They really, I mean, it's just great to, as a leader, it is just great to see. The one area that I worry about, and I, I'm particularly seeing this, this is something we're really focused on the NSA side. Again, on the NSA side, we got more people trying to get in the door than we have space for. The challenge that I, I, I am focused on, along with the broader team at NSA, is NSA's model, for example, traditionally was we have historically had incredibly high retention. Like, if you look at it across all the specialties, it, last year in 15, it was 96%. 96% of our workforce stayed with us. Um, that 4%, it's a little uneven. There are some areas where it's greater than 4%. That's across the board. And one of the areas that I'm particularly concerned about is as you look at the skills that these men and women have that are highly sought after in the private sector, we are not going to compete in salary, for example, with the Valley. Within a government structure, it's not going to happen. We have to compete with mission, ethos, culture, the idea that you're serving something bigger than yourself, that you're working with a bunch of motivated men and women who are really good at what they do, they care about what they do, and they do the right thing the right way. 
and that you're part of a culture that you want to be a part of. That's our edge. That's how, what enables us to, to recruit and retain motivated men and women. But one of the areas we've got to look at is what are the core skill sets that NSA, and we're going to do the same thing on the Cyber Command side, but we're starting with NSA. What are the core skill sets that NSA needs to remain relevant for the future? And within those skill sets, what is retention and re attrition looking like? What do we need to do to develop more of them? What do we need to, re to do to retain more of them? So we've actually got a, a, an in-depth ongoing process right now that we're doing to, using to do that. Th thanks very much. Thank you. Good, thank you. This gentleman, please. Sir. Well, thank you for being with us tonight. My name is Greg Allen. I'm a joint okay. degree at the Harvard Business School and Harvard Kennedy School, uh, along with my co-author, Daniel Chan, who's sitting there in front of you. Um, I, have the, yes, uh, I have the pleasure of working on my master's thesis on behalf of Jason Matheny, the director of IARPA. Yeah. And we're looking at artificial intelligence and national security policy making context. Okay. So my question for you is twofold. First is, how does the growth, expected future growth of artificial intelligence capabilities change the cyber mission? And what capabilities does the United States government need to develop to prepare for that future? So artificial intelligence and machine learning, I would argue, is foundational to the future of cybersecurity. Most, most, not all, most defensive strategies today in the cyber arena are based on the idea of a priori knowledge. Hey, look. I recognize previously known activity and I optimize my sensors, I optimize my structures, I optimize my processes to defeat the known. And you're sub-optimized for the unknown. Artificial intelligence and machine learning, if we could get cyber defensive systems to be able to learn so they can anticipate, this is particularly goes to the zero day piece, that would be incredibly powerful. Now there's a flip side to this. What are the implications of artificial intelligence and machine learning structures in the development of zero day vulnerabilities? So, so there's a double, I'm the first to acknowledge, there's a double edged sword here. And you're not gonna get the one without the other. And so we gotta work our way through how are we gonna deal with this? Because it is not the if, it's only the when to me. This is coming. I am not one who argues, boy, artificial intelligence we should fundamentally walk away from. I, I would argue we need to use it in very focused, very tailored ways, and we need to have very specific thoughts about where are we comfortable with that versus where do we feel we need the man or woman in the loop. And that'll vary by the level of risk, it'll vary by the mission, it'll vary by the function. Great, Great thanks. Thank you, the lady here, that's this mic. Thank you, Admiral. My name is Neha, I'm a PhD candidate at the Fletcher School. Uh, my question to you is, do you think uh, an increased reliance on offensive cyber war technologies and artificial intelligence will make it easier for the United States to wage war? And by easier, I mean um, low human and financial costs, limited mm. congressional oversight, and limited accountability from American voters. C could you, boy, I, I, I'd have to tell you I would fundamentally reject the premise that I okay. thought I heard. <laughs> First of all, I remind people, the application of offensive cyber capability follows the same rules that we do for kinetics. We must comply with the law of armed conflict. The use of it must be proportional. It must be discreet. It must be uh, very discretionary. One of the things that I'm very happy about is after some number of months, for example, of applying offensive cyber capability in Syria and Iraq, you have not heard NGOs, for example, coming forward and arguing, hey, the U.S.'s application of this has precluded our ability. Again, because we've been very specific, very measured, in the same way as it comes to when we drop kinetic ordinance. That's kind of at the, at the foundation of what we do. Cyber in no way is a tool designed to circumvent that lawful framework. We, we just wouldn't do it, and legally you can't do it. I also remind people, look, cyber to me, the offensive use of cyber is not a replacement for traditional means of warfare. My view is, look, it's another tool that's available to policymakers and operational commanders to decide, does, this, does its application make sense here? And that decision will vary by the specifics, by the effect we're trying to achieve. It's not a one size fits all, hey, cyber does away with the need to drop bombs, for example. I, 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 at least, maybe others have a different view. I just don't see it that way. Thank you. This lady in the lounge, please. Oh. 
Thank you so much for speaking with us today. Uh, my name is Diane Lee. I'm a freshman at the college. Um, and my question is about the USA Freedom Act. Uh, I'm sorry, Diane, could you say your question is about, I didn't hear that. Part. The USA Freedom Act. Got it, USA Freedom Act. Um, so the Freedom Act was created in part to limit bulk domestic surveillance allowed by the Patriot Act, which was the act it replaced. Um, and, but uh, for instance, the EFF has noted that there isn't any specific language in the Freedom Act limiting um, uh, domestic bulk surveillance. Could you speak to your thoughts on the Freedom so Act and maybe? Can I disagree with the premise in the question? It wasn't intended to quote. Can you repeat to me the way you phrased it? I apologize. You, you oh, said, sorry. Which which part? You said that the USA Freedom Act was designed to. Mm -hmm. Oh, to limit in part to limit um, the bulk domestic surveillance. Right. So I would argue yeah. that's not what it was designed to do. It was okay. designed to create a different framework for how that lawful collection and surveillance was going to be done. It fundamentally changed the current structure because under the previous structure, Section 215 of the Patriot Act, NSA used that legal authority to go to the FISA court, and the FISA court generated a legal order that told service providers to provide NSA every 90 days their called data records. It wasn't all service providers. It was three specific large ones. And it, it required them to provide those records to us. And then NSA held them. And then we would go back using what we call the reasonable articulable standard, i.e. NSA just couldn't arbitrarily go in and access the data. We had to meet a threshold for then going in and querying the data. What the USA Freedom Act was designed to do was to say, hey, look, we believe there is value in the intelligence structure being, to, being able to access that data. But we also believe there is value in that data being held by someone other than the intelligence structure. I, I try to remind people, go back and remember why the law was passed in the first place. And I encourage everybody, hey, read the 9-11 Commission report. One of the 9-11 hijackers happened to be an Al-Qaeda individual who was undergoing commercial aviation training in Southern California. In the course of the individual's training, this known Al-Qaeda operative, who we didn't know was in the United States, was placing phone calls back to a known Al-Qaeda-associated number overseas. We were monitoring the other end of this and we were unable to trace this phone call all the way back, and we didn't realize this phone call was originating from the United States. In the aftermath of 9-11, the 9-11 of Commission looked at this and said, look, we've got to come up with some legal framework for how we can try to tie foreign activity that NSA is observing from known terrorist-associated targets with potential activity in the United States. How can we try to make sure that that activity is ongoing and we have some level of awareness of it. So it wasn't because some bad man or woman said, you know, it would just be great if NSA could access phone data records. There was a specific reason and a specific thought process behind it. That seems to have largely been forgotten in the conversation in the last few years. And again, I'm not arguing that you got to agree. I only remind people, look, there honestly was a thought behind this and it didn't originate it from us. Read the 9-11 report. It talked about, hey, we got to come up with a mechanism to do that. As a result, Congress passed the Patriot Act. Section 215 enabled us to do that. Fast forward now to last year. And as the, the law was expiring December the 31st, if my memory's right, I could have the day wrong, I apologize. I should remember this because we spent a lot of time and effort on this. As the law was expiring, Congress had a debate and said, look, do we want to continue some framework or, or some legal basis for NSA and others to be able to access that data, but perhaps we want to do it in a way where NSA isn't holding the data, where the phone, in this case, the phone company is. And so thus was born the idea of the USA Freedom Act, which said NSA will go to a court and the court will provide an order to the phone company and the phone company will have to provide the call data records back to us on an individual specific basis, not in large volume. Um, I'm comfortable with the way it worked out. My comment was, look, as long as NSA, through a court, 
can have timely, reasonable access, I think that's fair. And if this process generates greater confidence within our citizens, that's a positive. Now, I also remind people there's a trade-off. This process is slightly slower. This process is costing you, the taxpayers, more money. I'm not arguing that's a bad thing. I just remind people nothing's free. And we just need to make sure we understand it. I'm comfortable with it. I think it was a very good compromise. I think it's a reasonable compromise. The promise that I made to Congress was we're now, this went into effect in February, if my memory is correct, so we're, you know, um, eight months into the new structure. What I had promised Congress was if I see in the actual use of this new structure, either it's too slow or it fails to provide the kind of insights that I think we need, I will come back to the Congress as the elected representatives of our citizens, and I will say that. To date, eight months into this, uh, I'm comfortable with where we are, and I think it's a reasonable approach, realizing that there's always trade-offs. So, so good. We, unfortunately, we have only three minutes left, and we have many three people minutes. up. So we're going to take this gentleman and this gentleman. So please. Thank you very much, ma'am. Sir. Admiral uh, Ensign Richard Kuzma. I'm an MPP student here at the Kennedy School. So looking into a future where unmanned and autonomous systems uh, possibly operate fluidly with current manned units and understanding the need for exceptional trust with, uh, for a human machine team to operate effectively, uh, what if any new challenges do you see in maintaining information assurance with these hmm. uh, autonomous systems in a contested cyber battle space? Yeah, so it, it kind of goes to the, the point I made about artificial intelligence and machine learning. <clears throat> it's not just autonomous systems. The Internet of Things is about to complicate, it'll, don't get me wrong, it will provide great service and capability for all of us as citizens. It'll en enable us to do some really amazing things. But from a defensive standpoint, the increased interconnectivity of the world we're living in also offers amazing potential vulnerability if we're not careful. And it's a level of vulnerability that we don't truly understand. In, in my day as a young college student, an automobile was a mechanical system <laughs> that had no remote access other than a one-way receive-only radio, although you could argue with a, a CB, you could actually talk both ways. But the, it was a series of mechanical systems that were, that were independent, had no external connections. You look at the automobile, and I raise the automobile because the automobile to me is in some ways the poster child for this phenomenon. You look at the automobile of today, it is a series of interconnected software applications and capabilities in which a whole host of remote connectivity is ongoing on a regular basis in a way in which you, the driver, don't understand and have no level of awareness. <laughs> that offers both amazing capability, insight, knowledge, the, the, the data that you can now access, the information and capability you can use to make that vehicle safer, to make decisions faster, potentially to be autonomous, totally autonomous as we go to you know, remotely piloted, so to speak, autonomous vehicles is really amazing. But there's also a flip side to this. That car now has a whole lot of vulnerabilities that it never had before. And so we gotta figure out what are the implications of that and how are we going to work our way through this? Because as a guy tasked with defending networks, boy, I think to myself, this is making life a whole lot harder. Not a bad, it's not a bad thing, but it's just making life a whole lot harder. So if you can ask your question in 30 seconds, and <laughs> if you can answer in 30 seconds, this gentleman. I'll Sir, best. give me a yes or no. <laughs> uh, thank you for a great discussion. My name is Scott Anderson. I'm a fellow at the law school and associate uh, here at the Kennedy School. Um, we've seen several international groups make an effort to try and clarify how different types of cyber activities fit within existing systems of international Speak laws. Speak a little closer to the yeah, microphone. Oh, I'm sorry about that. Uh, we've seen various international groups of act academics and practitioners make efforts to clarify how different types of cyber activities fit within existing international laws and norms mm -hmm. for state behavior, uh, the Talon Manual being probably the most prominent example of that. And we saw DOD take a step uh, expressing its own view in its chapter on cyber operations in the Law of War Manual, uh, at least in the Law of Armed Conflict context. Right. How important or how central a role does the cultivation of these international rules of the road play in the U.S. strategy for mitigating cyber risk, and what is its strategy for engaging that international process for developing these norms and I mean, standards? I think, I'll keep this very simple. Look, I think a broader international framework is definitely going to be part of our strategy as we move forward. 
one of the implications of cyber is oftentimes, not always, but it makes unique nation-based you know, nation solutions much more tenuous, much more difficult. And so we're gonna have to come up with broader strategy. Um, so that's how I'd answer that real quick. Can I just make one final statement Please. if I could? Um, I wanna thank you for tonight. We were able to engage in a very civil dialogue. We were able to be very direct and honest with each other. And we were able to do it from a wide variety of perspectives. And we were able to do it without vilifying each other with, hey, you're good, I'm bad. We have got to do that if we're gonna move forward on these issues. These are complex, there's no easy answer, and there's a lot of second and third order effects. And collectively, we gotta be willing to sit down and actually talk, not talk at each other, not talk past each other, but actually have a dialogue. And today, you had a variety of students from different schools, different perspectives. You had active duty military out here for things. I think that is the power of the academic world, the ability to bring together a whole lot of different perspectives to say, so, in a very open way, how are we gonna work our way through this? It's one of the reasons why I spend time in this job going to major universities across the United States and trying to spend time talking to both students and faculty. Hey, potentially one of you, others in this crowd may one day come work for US Cyber Command and NSA. I welcome you. You can do some amazing things with our organization that you can feel proud about. They're gonna help your fellow citizens. They're gonna help make our world more secure and that we're gonna do it in a way that you can feel proud about. And you can tell your parents, your family, your friends, I work at NSA, this is what I do, and I feel good about what I do. And I work at NSA at Cyber Command, and I feel proud and good about what I do. But to do all that, um, we have got to be willing to sit down and work our way through some tough issues. This is not easy work. But I thank you for your willingness to do that. So thank you very let me, much. Let me say two things in, in closing. <clears throat> I mean, this was a conversation that we would love to continue at much greater length, and I apologize for the many questions that people mm. wanted to ask that we didn't get a chance to. But for us here at a school of government, to have a leader from our government who's spending this much time this candidly, uh, when he's got only two jobs to do, <laughs> and another news story breaking <laughs> at the same time, I would say is a fantastic opportunity. So let's say thank you Thanks very, very much. much. Thank you very much. Thanks, man. It's great seeing you. Hey, you bet, man. It was great. Oops. <laughs> See you next time. Don't be a stranger. Yeah, absolutely, I will. <laughs>